everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I know as everyone is taking the time to enter the room, thanks for joining StoryCorps and the Office on Trafficking in Persons um, for our webinar today. We're just gonna give everyone some time to get in the door, um, get their technology set up, get settled so that we can spend some time this afternoon listening to stories um, and reflecting on the Voices of Freedom um, Oral History Project. Um, for those of you who are already in the virtual door, um, we'd love to hear from you if you want to um, use the little chat button in your menu and say hello, let us know who you are, where you're joining us from. Um, I know that there are folks from across the country and perhaps even across the world, so let us know who you are and where you are. Um, let us know how you're doing today. We would just love to see. We know that there are so many of you here with us and you can't see each other, but, um, but hopefully we can say hello in the chat. Um, and I'm just gonna do some very quick housekeeping as we, um, as we do that as well. Um, we are, I'm Emily, I forgot to say this. I'm from StoryCorps. I'm gonna be with us this whole um, time together today. Um, we are here in Zoom and uh, many of you are really familiar with this at this point, but wanna let you know, we'll be inviting you to um, engage with us using the chat throughout today. We encourage you to talk with us, to talk with each other in that space as we go through this together. Um, and we're going to be hearing from a number of people today throughout the next hour and 15 minutes. Um, and we'll save some time for questions at the end. So if you have any questions for, um, for StoryCorps, for the Office on Trafficking in Persons, um, for the participants that you'll hear from um, about the Voices of Freedom Oral History Project, use, um, we invite you to use the Q&A box to know that we'll be able to see those. We'll get to as many as we can towards the end, but use that spot if you have any issues with that along, along the way. Um, and then we are really happy to be providing live captions today. Um, if you'd like to use those throughout this time um, in your menu, you'll also see um, a button that says CC for captions. If you don't see it, you can look um, in your menu bar, the three dots and choose the closed captioning options to be able to access that as well. So I think now many of us have been able to join in the room. If you're just joining us now, please say hello in the chat, let us know where you're joining from. Um, I can let you all know that there's a big crowd today. Um, so know that you're in, you're in company and in community today, even though we're not able to all see each other at the same time. Um, uh, and, and again, thank you for joining us today. I am going to turn it over um, to Deborah Johnson, the Deputy Assistant Secretary for External Affairs at the Administration for Children and Families to officially get us started and launch us today. Well, thank you, Emily. Again, I am Deborah Johnson, the Deputy Assistant Secretary for External Affairs for the Administration for Children and Families. I want to welcome you, officially welcome you to the launch of Voices of Freedom. Today is an exciting day and I am glad to be here with all of you. I am pleased to welcome you all to the launch uh, of the Voices of Freedom Archive, a collection of more than 98 recorded conversations featuring the reflections of survivors of human trafficking and allied professionals in the anti-trafficking field. Voices of Freedom is a collaborative effort between the Office of Trafficking in Person, the Administration for Native Americans, and StoryCorps to preserve the voices of those who have informed, shaped, and contributed to the success of the anti-human trafficking field over the past two decades. In these personal and powerful stories, participants describe the moments that shaped them, the lessons they have learned and their hopes for the future of the anti-trafficking movement. As we celebrate the launch of Voices of Freedom, we simultaneously recognize today as World Day Against Trafficking in Person. Appropriately, the theme chosen for this year is Victims' Voices Lead the Way. The campaign highlights the importance of listening of listening and learning from the survivors of human trafficking. Likewise, Voices of Freedom emphasizes the crucial role that individuals with lived experience play in the fight against human trafficking. 
Over the years, HHS has expanded efforts to integrate survivor leadership and our collective work to prevent and respond to trafficking. This archive provides another opportunity for survivors um, expertise um, to inform continued progress in the field. In this regard, Voices of Freedom demonstrates the power of conversation and storytelling, illustrating how oral history is crucial to both public service and public record keeping. And I would know as a deputy of external affairs, the criticality of building partnership with our external stakeholders and tribes to create open dialogue on how to improve the lives of those we serve. In recognizing the importance of storytelling and listening to survivors, we must also uh, acknowledge the unfortunate reality that not every individual has always had the opportunity to be heard in alignment with the Biden-Harris administration's executive order on advancing racial equity and supporting and support for underserved communities, Voices of Freedom gives space for historically marginalized communities to tell their stories by sharing perspectives from a diverse range of audiences and, and lived experiences. Voices of Freedom promotes inclusivity, collaboration, and the necessity of diversity, equity, and inclusion in the development of anti-human trafficking programs and initiatives. The archive is one example of ACF's commitment to ensuring that um, ensuring equality is a central part of our mission by making new opportunities for individuals, families, and communities that have been historically ma marginalized by systemic injustices like human trafficking. In closing, at ACF, we are devoted to addressing the needs, strengths, and abilities of vulnerable populations. We seek to empower all individuals in their quest to live healthy and productive lives, regardless of identity or background. Voices of Freedom is just one element of our comprehensive uh, efforts to prevent human trafficking, but it is an important one. The diverse stories in the archive challenge us to re-examine the past to ensure the voices of those who experience trafficking in the present are heard. Today on World Day Against Trafficking in Person, we celebrate the launch of Voices of Freedom, Freedom and commemorate each voice in the archive by renewing our efforts to prevent trafficking and to serve the individuals, families, and communities who are impacted. Thank you so much, Deborah, uh, for joining us this morning and for the launch of the Voices of Freedom initiative and the archive. Um, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Catherine Chan. I'm the director of the Office on Trafficking in Persons. And uh, at this time, what we'll do is have a panel conversation among our, the federal partners and the um, private partners who collaborated together on this initiative. I welcome Carolyn Hightower, Deputy Director of the Office on Trafficking in Persons, Michelle Save, the Acting Commissioner of the Administration for Native Americans, and Emily Jansen, the Associate Director for Learning Engagement at uh, StoryCorps. Okay, as they come on, uh, I wanted to just start off with a uh, moment of gratitude uh, for this collaboration and also for all the staff support. Uh, many of you on the call may have heard from uh, Kimberly Casey, from Kate Cooper, from other uh, staff at the Office on Trafficking in Persons, as well as colleagues over at StoryCorps uh, to help organize facilitated interviews, to answer any questions about Connect interviews. Uh, and although you see these representatives on the panel, there are so many people who contributed to uh, this project and initiative, and thank you to them. So Carolyn, I wanted to start with you. Uh, you have been involved with this project from the very beginning uh, and, and the, um, in the ideation of the collaboration with StoryCorps. Uh, what motivated you uh, to encourage uh, this collaboration from the perspective of the Office on Trafficking in Persons? Well, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, wherever you are. 
Uh, thank you, Catherine. You know, I have always loved StoryCorps. <laughs> I have listened to StoryCorps for years and loved the inspiring story, stories that you hear on, uh, on radio, as well as um, the diversity of opinions. Uh, there are so many thought-provoking ideas that come through the stories that are told. And one of the things that struck me as we thought about the 20 year anniversary of the passage of the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, uh, I could remember back in 2000 when I was working at another agency and we were told that funding would become available and they emphasized this is one time funding, don't expect any more, we have no idea of the scope of this problem and just kind of feeling like, well, what do we do uh, in that period of time? And looking back 20 years later at the progress has been, that has been made, I am in awe of the work that has been done across the federal government, as well as uh, by stakeholders in the field. Um, one of the things that was important to me was so often the voices of victims are muted either by their trafficker and sometimes uh, inadvertently by people who are there to help them because they want to represent them. Either it's a prosecutor or it's a, a victim advocate and that's unintentional. And I feel like this was an opportunity to empower victims to speak on their own behalf, to tell their own story. Uh, and I have been just really overwhelmed with some of the stories that we have heard uh, they're so positive and hopeful. And uh, I really uh, enjoyed those stories where people laughed and they talked about their experiences and they talked about working together. So it was really, uh, you know, out of an interest of empowering victims, but it was also in an, out of an interest of ensuring that we have a record of what's transpired over the past 20 years, uh, because a lot has happened and there's still so much more to, uh, to, to do. And I think uh, that these stories help us shape the future, but they also help us document the past. Carolyn, can you speak a little bit more to that? How do you believe oral histories are an important part of both public service and public record keeping? Well, I think, uh, you know, I, this isn't my first oral history project. I was uh, involved in another project when I worked for the Department of Justice, and it was basically chronicling the activities that um, propelled the whole crime victims' rights uh, movement within uh, the federal government. And from time to time, whenever we were kind of struggling with what direction we should go in, we would go back and look at that, those oral histories and listen to some of the, what they refer to in, in the crime victims field as old buffaloes, talk about the early days of the victims' rights movement and some of the challenges that they faced and overcame. And I think that that was in part for me, an important lesson about having that, those historical voices because Unfortunately, a lot of the people who were there in the early days of the victims' rights movement have since either moved on or passed away. And it's really a great opportunity to go back and be able to hear those voices again and be inspired by them. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, Michelle, the Administration for Native Americans has been an important partner on this project. Can you share a little bit about why your office decided to support Voices of Freedom? Um, thank you, Catherine. First, I just want to say, you know, we felt very honored to be a part of this project. Um, I think for some of the same reasons that uh, both Carolyn and Deborah have shared, just that the, the persons who are impacted, um, and it, it's not just the survivors, it's their families, it's their communities, uh, especially um, in Native communities, there, there's such an extended network that this, um, the impacts just kind of ripple out. And I think it's true for most communities. Um, but knowing that um, and being able to understand what those impacts are within those communities and also how to address it is so important. And through our partnership over the years, 
um, ANA and OTIP has really had a lot of active engagement and listening with tribal leaders, different native communities, and we've learned a lot about the specific um, social, economic, and legal vulnerabilities that make Native Americans more likely to be targeted by traffickers. And we've also learned a lot about cultural protective factors. And those are things you don't learn about if you don't listen to those that are being impacted. So we were just really uh, grateful to have this opportunity um, to help identify uh, those voices um, so that they can be part of the broader narrative. Thank you, Michelle. I, I recall from um, a recent tribal consultation when we were talking about the Voices of Freedom effort, even uh, getting the candid responses of, on the one hand, the importance of uh, the oral uh, tradition within many Native communities, but then also given the current circumstances of the pandemic and many other um, challenges that communities are facing, um, that it's often the reality was that it's often hard to even carve out the space to contribute to um, an effort like this because of um, so much of the disruptions that have been happening. So um, that that pointed to us of the importance of the ongoing uh, nature of um, talking story um, and creating that space, which this initiative will continue to do. So thank you, Michelle. Uh, and then Emily, uh, you and your team have been incredibly supportive of uh, this effort um, uh, that's intended to inspire and equip people to share their stories. I'm curious about what your initial thoughts were when you first heard about this project and collaborating with um, the federal government and how it aligned with StoryCorps' mission. Thanks, Catherine. Well, for those who don't know um, really explicitly, our mission at StoryCorps is to preserve and share humanity's stories to create a more just and compassionate world. And um, since we started over a decade ago, we've done that with a really simple model of just bringing people together to have conversations like everyone's done um, for the Freedom um, Voices of Freedom project. Um, and that hasn't changed over that time, but what, what we've seen happen in all of this time is um, where that model and that commitment to really listening grows. And we do that um, through partnerships like this. It's, that's how we can make this archive that we've been preserving for generations to come. How do we make sure that that archive is representative? How do we make sure that we're hearing the voices that um, you know, Carolyn was saying earlier have traditionally been muted um, either in the community or in history? And, um, and we're able to do that because we have partners who are really committed to listening to their communities. And so I think for us, it was exciting to have um, a really committed collaboration um, of, of folks who really have throughout this whole process been committed to the people who are having those conversations together and valuing them um, and providing this space to really say um, your experience as survivors, your experience as advocates, um, to speak that in your own words and have that become a part of this history that StoryCorps can help make sure we can all share and listen to um, for generations to come. Thank you, Emily. Um, so this is a question for any and all of you. Um, have there been any particular stories or moments in this process uh, that resonated with you? I can Carolyn. speak really quick. Okay, oh. Emily, I'll turn it over to you oh, first. We both, yeah. I'm sorry, mine is not even a particular moment and this, this gives us sort of, gets us ready for what we're about to share later on. But I think, um, from my end, what has been the most powerful has been that StoryCorps was really able to help facilitate and record a number of conversations. But this huge collection um, that's come from this collaboration has been because so many more people have on their own um, invited 
people in their community to share their stories and add their voices. And I think the most powerful thing has been to watch that grow and watch that you all have a network that is so committed and connected um, to want to all be a part of that and make sure that the diversity of experiences and voices are heard. So this is Carolyn again. Um, you know, it's difficult to pick out one or two stories because they're all so fascinating. I mean, I have not had an opportunity to listen to them all, but the ones that I've listened to, with each one, there is a nuance about the experience and the response and the recovery uh, from the trafficking situation that they ex uh, experienced. Um, and. I think the ones that stuck with me most were the ones that were hopeful. And you'll hear from uh, three of the participants today and their stories are, I think, reflective of the kinds of conversations that went on. They were very personal, uh, but also that they were, as I said earlier, hopeful. And uh, what I appreciated most about them is that uh, they didn't sugarcoat the situation, uh, not now and not then. And each of them made recommendations of things that we should be thinking about as we move forward to advance the anti-trafficking movement. Um, I also want to say that it was a, a great honor to be able to partner with a and uh, because really this whole concept of um, talking circles comes from the native communities. And as we thought about this and we reached out to ANA, I thought that this is the perfect collaboration between our two offices because uh, in the culture of the Native Americans, uh, they have always had these talking circles and listening sessions and uh, they are such a great way to transfer information from generation to generation. And, and I'll just echo what, what Carolyn just said. Um, I think through, through this process, it really does honor that learning through stories and sharing uh, your, your you know, personal experiences. Um, it can be so um, effective and really reach people in a way that just, you know, numbers and, uh, um, statistics and facts that don't always, you know, convey. And so once again, I do think you know, this has been a, a wonderful collaboration um, and those stories do last for generations. So hopefully um, we'll, you know, be um, hope for future generations um, as well as um, instructive to um, for prevention efforts. Thank you so much to Michelle, Carolyn, Emily for uh, providing some of your perspectives around this public-private and intergovernmental collaboration. And I'll turn it back over to Emily, I think at this point. Grant, I'm gonna send it to, um, to Kimberly, I think. Thank you. We are so excited to officially launch the Voices of Freedom Archive. Over the past several months, our team has had the privilege of listening to and learning from these conversations. As you listen today and in the future, we hope that you will see the significant progress that has been achieved over the past two decades, that you'll be motivated by the resilience and leadership modeled by those with lived experience, and that you will learn from the recommendations and vision for the future outlined by participants. As you heard earlier, as of today, we have 98 recordings in the archive and more are on the way. 176 people have participated, including more than 47 individuals with lived experience in human trafficking. We have worked to curate an archive that reflects the individuals impacted by all forms of human trafficking with targeted outreach to underserved communities and marginalized populations. 
because of the virtual nature of this project, we've received recordings from dozens of cities and states across the US, as well as Guam and the United Kingdom. The archive includes perspectives from survivors who were trafficked before the TVPA and those that have experienced benefits and protections offered through it and subsequent federal and state legislation. We also hear from professionals who were working with individuals experiencing trafficking before it was defined as such, and from those who are part of the early work negotiating the Palermo Protocol and the TVPA and standing up some of the very first programs dedicated to this issue. Some of the individuals who shared have decades of experience, while others are newer to the field with one or two years of work. Participants come from a variety of disciplines, including federal and state governments, healthcare, child welfare, service provision, public health, education, advocacy, law enforcement and the judiciary, and academia. In some cases, participants chose to record with a colleague, while others invited friends or family members to be their recording partner. When we invited participants to record, we were often asked, what would you like us to talk about? Our response was that these 40 minutes belong to them. We provided an overview of the project and sample questions to help them get started, but encouraged them to speak about whatever was most important to them. We are so grateful for the authentic and meaningful perspectives that we received. While all conversations centered around the shared topic of human trafficking, each story is unique because it also centers the person or the people who are sharing their story. We have a lot of work ahead of us to fully unpack all of the themes, nuance, lessons learned, and recommendations provided through these recordings. Very broadly, we heard about the foundational impact of the TVPA and how it catalyzed meaningful resources and protections across various sectors. We also heard about progress on important issues like survivor leadership and reaching underserved communities, but were reminded that gaps continue to persist. Many highlighted challenges, fractures, and experiencing unequal access to services and leadership opportunities. We heard many examples of resilience and perseverance through these challenges and people's lived experience with trafficking. Participants discussed the need for increased diversity, equity, and inclusion, and ensuring that people and programs are reflective of the communities that they serve. We were reminded of the importance of allyship with some survivors sharing specific examples of what this looks like from their perspective. Others shared about the importance of recognizing the impact of trauma on survivors, regardless of how long it has been since their trafficking experience. Many discussed intergenerational trauma and shared personal stories of their efforts to break the cycle. Finally, we were reminded of the importance of comprehensive strategies that prevent re-victimization and those that disrupt human trafficking before it occurs. We are so excited to continue to unpack and apply the information and recommendations provided by all of our participants. We are working on various efforts to cultivate this information in a way that benefits you and all of our stakeholders. We will continue to spotlight recordings that align with different groups or topics, such as those that we've done for AAPI Heritage Month and Pride. We're also producing a series of videos highlighting segments of different conversations. The first of these six videos are available on our website today, with more being released in the coming months. And on that note, I'm thrilled to turn the conversation over to my colleague, Emily, who will share three of the pieces that we've produced from recordings in the archive, and who will speak with the participants who shared their stories in these pieces. Emily? Thank you, Kimberly. Um, it's really, again, it's been such an honor, everyone at StoryCorps who has worked on this collaboration um, to help record and preserve and share stories. Um, and we're excited to share with you right now, um, while we're together, just three of those conversations that are 
um, were shared as part of Voices of Freedom. So first, we are going to hear a selection from a longer conversation between Catherine Chan, the director of the Office on Trafficking in Persons, who we heard from earlier, and fellow advocate Harold D'Souza. In addition to leading nationwide efforts to end trafficking, Harold is also a survivor of labor trafficking and debt bondage. So we're going to um, listen together right now. Harold D'Souza tells his friend and colleague, Catherine Chan, about his journey from experiencing labor trafficking to becoming a leading activist in the nationwide effort to address the problem. Harold has served the White House on the United States Advisory Council on Human Trafficking and is founder and president of Eyes Open International, a nonprofit group focused on combating human trafficking through empowerment. I am an immigrant from India, and I am a survivor of human labor trafficking and debt bondage, which happened in Cincinnati, but today I am a free man. I always tell that survivors are poor starters, but strong finishers. When you were younger, did you ever imagine advising presidents, governors, others on how to improve life for communities that are very underserved? It's a blessing that in the year 2015, December 16th, President Barack Obama announced my name on the United States Advisory Council on Human Trafficking. And there were 11 survivors who were appointed. I was so deeply touched. Everyone respected us so much that they never looked at us as survivors. They looked at us as experts. And that totally transformed my life. When I was a child, I was a failure. I failed in all the subjects. It was my dad. He always believed in me. And whenever I come to the White House, I have my dad's photograph. Hmm. I carry it all the time. So Harold, your father was a big influence in your life. And you are a father. How is your family responding to the work that you're doing now? I have two boys. Bradley is 25 years old and Rohan is 22 years old. They're so grounded. But we don't talk much about what happened in our life. My younger son was slapped in front of my own eyes by my trafficker for no reason. And I didn't do anything. I just looked and I was quiet. I didn't know what to do. I was so helpless. When I come to the White House, people call me Honorable Harold D'Souza. But in real life, when you're a victim, they say, hey, illegal, come here. They call you illegal. And what happens? In my mind, I think I'm a criminal. What do you hope will be different 50 years from now? I am always working on that, how we can combat or stop human trafficking. So I think after 50 years, things should be different. We need to take care of our kids. We need to love them. And we need to see that they follow in the right track. You know, I always tell my kids, enjoy your life. But at the same breath, see what you can give back to the community. And if you can help somebody, why not? That when you save one victim, Catherine, you save one survivor. But when you prosecute one perpetrator, you are saving 100 victims. Catherine, you have played a very big role in my life. Delegates like you are like Mother Teresa for me. Mother Teresa always says, do not waste time judging people. Just love them. That's what you have done from day one. If one of your sons or your grandchildren are carrying a picture of you in their pockets, what would you be saying to them? Do not tell God how big the storm is in your life, but tell the storm how big the God is in your life. Believe in yourself and be happy. Thank you so much, Harold. These Voices of Freedom were recorded and produced by StoryCorps in partnership with the Office on Trafficking in Persons at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. For more information, visit acf.hhs.gov slash OTIP slash voices. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, um, Harold, for sharing your story and Catherine um, for having that conversation. Um, we're really pleased that Harold is with us here today. Um, so Harold, um, if you wanna wave hello and say hello to everyone. Um, hello, turn friends. your microphone on. Thank you, Emily. And yeah. 
Team Story Corp and all my friends who are watching from all across the world and each and every individual who are watching me and empowering me today. Thank you. Yeah, Harold, again, thank you so much for being so generous to have this conversation, to share it um, with StoryCorps and the Voices of Freedom archive. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, why did you decide to participate in this project by having a conversation with Catherine? And what was that like to sit down with her? Emily and Catherine and all my friends across the globe, I just didn't know what I was doing. I just got an email. I went with the flow. And being a survivor, I'll be very honest, when anyone invites me to do a presentation in a school, in a community, in a government, international, virtual, I just say yes. Because my overall objective is to create awareness and prevention. I always say that it's better to be safe than sorry. And with my story, if I can empower somebody, why not? Because I was in such a situation, uh, Emily, that for 10 years I was not talking. Because it was a stigma, it was a shame. And I never wanted anyone to know my story. And today what Story Cops is doing, you are doing a very fantastic job, not only in the United States of America, but worldwide across the globe and not only today since it's a UN World Day against trafficking in person because this is every second every minute every hour every day every week every month every year and this is what you all are doing so thank you very much uh, story cops and uh, Catherine so Harold how was it you've had the opportunity to share your story in a lot of different settings as you've said how was this different um, to sit down for 40 minutes with Catherine. Um, did, that, did that bring up anything different? Did you tell your story in a different way? Um, what was that like? I think the best part about Story Corps is that they make the survivors so comfortable and they get a family atmosphere within us. And when I was given a choice and opportunity to decide anyone who can take my interview, you know, like, and see, I'll tell you very honest, many times survivors, Family members are individuals like you, like, you know, Emily, uh, uh, Deborah, and all the audience. So when, and I'm, I, they gave, I had an opportunity to do it with Catherine, which I just saw the name. And I said, yeah, I'll do it with her. And then I realized she's a director, you know, of office on trafficking in person. She's in a, a very high position. But at the same breath, she's so cool, caring, and compassionate. That makes the difference in the life of a victim and a survivor, humanity. And that's everything is there within us. You know, that's why I call her like Mother Catherine. You know, it's not in words, you know, but it's in deeds. And when, I don't know when I met her for the first time, uh, Emily, uh, Catherine, but till date, that is the beauty of story cops or office on talking in person. And that makes an individual different. Till today, she always will be in touch with me. She'll contact me. I just want to give a small example. You know, like, uh, I know uh, Kimberly Casey is on, on, the, on the call today, but I saw a less contact with her and she came to know that I was sick three weeks back, I was in the hospital, right? And I had, no, I had never thought that I'll come back and be in a position to talk today. But I think Catherine came to know that I'm, I was in the hospital and then she contacted my wife and asked, oh, what do you want? Do you need any help? You know, this is very, very powerful. At many times, survivors globally do not look for sympathy. They look for empathy. So well, thank you. Oh, thank you again so much, Harold. And we're so happy to see you um, able to be with us today and in good health. One more final question. I'm curious, have you been able to share your recording with your sons and your family? You know, I'll be very honest today with you, with all my audience. Uh, my kids, they do not watch I don't talk to them on this particular subject. It, I think it triggers them. It triggers me also. I'll be very honest. I just want to share with all the audience today a confession, which uh, is that I never ever watch my talk shows. I don't know why. I might start it, I might watch for 30 seconds or one minute. I just shut it off. There are so many people who have written articles about me in the newspapers, and then they call me. Everybody said it was such a good article. And I just say, yes, yes, thank you very much. And I've not read the articles. So I don't know, that's something like has still traumatized me. I still try to understand myself. So I never watch it. I don't know why. But I mean, I just want to be honest with Catherine and you. But I, I watched this video, the one which you all did, edited one. And that's very, very powerful. 
and i watched that couple of times but i not watched the original 40 minutes or whatever you know yeah i'm so glad harold thank you so much again for your generosity and having the conversation and for just spending the time with us today um i do hope you know as a reminder to everyone that conversation that you recorded is um archived with story core and at the american folk life center at the library of congress um and as part of this collection so you know if there ever is a time in the future you know where your family wants to have to listen they'll be able to know that they have have your voices your voice there on that story um so next we are going to um hear from another family who sat down together um kimberly chang is a family physician at asian health services in oakland california and in her work there she cares for and advocates for victims of sex and labor trafficking and she sat down um with story core with her sister Allison and her mother Jocelyn to talk about their own family's connection to Kimberly's work. So let's listen to that together. Kimberly Chang tells her sister Allison Chang and their mother Jocelyn Chang about her work caring and advocating for victims of sex and labor trafficking in a community health center. Together, the three women reflect on how their shared family history connects to Kimberly's work today. Kim, why don't you tell us how you became involved in working to help the victims of human trafficking? I'm a family doctor at a community health center in Oakland, California. I came to this work in human trafficking because many of our patients were being sex trafficked in the streets of Oakland. These were children and youth. There was a patient who came in one night who was really sick. I thought she was going to die. And I told her she needed to go to the hospital. She told me I'd rather die than go back to jail. On a previous hospitalization for a miscarriage, she was discharged to the county jail because there was a bench warrant for her arrest on charges of solicitation or prostitution. She was only 15. I remember thinking, wow, this is a patient who has no control over the situation that she's in, and she's a kid. They should be treated as victims and provided support services. You have the Hawaiian spirit call, the ohana, where we take care of each other and pono to respect each other and do things for each other. Growing up in Hawaii, where it's an island and the community knows each other, I think that has imbued a lot of the values for the work that I do. In our history, we actually had someone who was human trafficked. Recently, I came across letters from 1931 that were written by our great grandmother that told this really fantastical story. When she was 10 years old, she was kidnapped from Vietnam. She was taken to China and sold as a maid. After she got injured, she was sold to a brothel in Hong Kong, where she was viciously beaten and mistreated. Finally, the cook at the brothel told this young girl, the next time you see a police officer, run outside and ask him for help. So when our great-grandmother ran out, the police officer took her before a judge. And when he saw her injuries, he took pity on her and sent her to an orphanage, then to Swiss missionaries in Hong Kong, who then raised her until she was 18. To me, it was a sign of resilience and hope. This young girl was kidnapped and sex trafficked and labor trafficked back in the late 1800s. And her descendants are us. You know, human trafficking and exploitation is much broader than just sex trafficking. It's about tapping into our shared humanity. How do we make the policies broader so that everyone is included in systems of care and protection? And so it's about love, really. Life has come around full circle for Kim to be doing what she's doing. The hope is that what you're doing, Kim, will alter someone's life three generations from now, right? I mean, to have that one cook who helped our great grandmother. We all touch other people's lives. And so you want to make those ripple effects full of love, hope, charity, and full of compassion. Yeah, and as big as you can make them. These Voices of Freedom were recorded and produced by StoryCorps 
in partnership with the Office on Trafficking in Persons at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. For more information, visit acf.hhs.gov slash OTIP slash voices. Oh. Again, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, um, Kim and Jocelyn and Allison. Um, I see you've come join us to say to say hello. Um, thank you for sharing sharing that. Um, we'll just sort of ask all of you as we say hello. Um, what was that experience like to sit down and have this type of conversation together? Were you nervous? Were you excited? You've obviously had many conversations before as family members. Um, so what was that experience like for you? Kim, go first. Um, yeah, it was, uh, it was, it's fun. I, I'm glad you, you folks are game and I sucked you into it and, and, and I really, I really enjoyed it. And I, I just wanted to, you know, include you in my, in my life and in my work. So thanks mom and Ali. When Kim told us about this project, we thought, wow, there's such a thing that's going on. StoryCorps is, you're not physicians, but you're magnifying the work that's being done in trafficking. And so we thought, okay, that's, that's really great. We wish something like this had happened years ago so that we would have something to relate to, but this is great. And Ali has a story to share too. Um, I don't have a story, but I, I was, I was, uh, I was, whenever Kim contacts me about her work, usually it's, hey, can you donate some money? <laughs> so, <laughs> Thank so, you. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> and so uh, it was, I was, you know, I was pretty surprised and, and kind of happy that she asked me to interact with her in this way, because we very rarely get to interact in our personal lives, except for that donation kind of area, <laughs> since Kim is, you know, don't, uh, um, dedicated her life to serving the community, and I'm a bad corporate lawyer. So did you, in having the, you know, sitting down intentionally and having this conversation, did you, um, did you learn anything new from one another, or um, did, did you have the conversation in a different way than you've had in the past about um, your own family's history or your work now? I think um. Oh, yeah, go, ahead. Go, ahead. Go, ahead, Mom. go, Mom. I think that when this came about, it was probably a month after we had gone through all of our family's papers, old papers and old letters. We were searching through it and, and discovered this thing about a uh, great grandmother being trafficked. And it just brought, it just magnified everything. And so it, it prompted all of this conversation, which is, I think, amazing. The, the timing is amazing. Yeah, and I was I was thinking just now, um, hearing uh, Harold's um, story and, and hearing Emily you speak about the, the project and, and Catherine speaking about the project. You know, you talk about bringing up voices and I just thought, wow, this is really incredible that we could, well, we never really knew about this great grandmother and, um, and that we could bring that voice up and that, experience and that that um, history of I thought that was a pretty um, weirdly cosmically uh, interrelated somehow anyway weird <laughs> but but very cool Would you any oh go ahead let's down with work and advocate. I'm used to it and it and it continues on for days or weeks or lifetimes or generations and that's that's what StoryCorps is spurring on, not just this one 40 minute conversation, but a life of these conversations. Well, thank you all so much. I'm, I'm 
again, grateful for your generosity of having this conversation, for being able to, um, Kim, to allow sort of this really more personal story um, to become a part of the larger advocacy work that you do as well. Um, the three of you, thank you. And Jocelyn and Allison, thank you for being up with the sunrise in Hawaii with us this morning um, and willing to be to be here with us today. We're so grateful. One more um, thing. One yes, more thing. go Kim. I'm going to take from, from Harold. I'm going to start carrying pictures of, of my mom and my dad in my, in my, in my wallet. So thanks, Harold. <laughs> Thank you, Harold. Um, okay, <laughs> Ali, you can you can be there sometimes. I like you. <laughs> I love it. So we have one more story to share, um, kind of to preview for you some of this collection from Voices of Freedom and these um, six stories that will be um, continue to be released to highlight different aspects. Um, in this selection, we hear from Wilnesha Sutton and Shannon Sagamani, and they are colleagues and friends and have been for years. They both advocate to end trafficking, and Wilnesha is also a survivor herself. So let's listen um, to a, just a little bit of the conversation that they had together. Wilnesha Sutton tells her friend and colleague, Shannon Sagamani, about her journey from sex trafficking survivor to her current work in anti-trafficking. Wilnesha discusses the positive changes she has seen in the field, especially around vacature laws, which authorize courts to undo or vacate criminal convictions that are the result of a person being trafficked. My trafficking experience happened about 15 years ago. I just identified as a prostitute because that's all I thought I was and that's all that I heard and that was on my record, right? A lot of white women were telling me, you're a human trafficking victim. And I was like, no, I'm not. I'm a prostitute. This was the life I chose. In the anti-trafficking pamphlets and websites, I didn't see women that looked like me. So I was like, that's for y'all. That's not for me. But then I went to Ghana. I went to Africa and I saw how the Black women were treated there, how they were protected. And I was like, I've never felt this protected or felt this seen in America. So when I came back, I was like, I want to help young girls and women that have been through what I've been through. I think I'm going to start working in the human trafficking community. Are there any accomplishments that the anti-trafficking field has had in the last 20 years? Most definitely criminal vacature. Oh my gosh. Criminal vacature is during your victimization, if you have anything that's on your record from misdemeanor to felony, and it happened during a time while you're being victimized and you tell your story, then you can have it to where your record is not expunged, but they have to demolish your file. Like it never existed. I just received my criminal vacature. The judge is like, I read over your declaration. You did the work to change your life. I'm really proud of you. Can I come off my bench and shake your hand? I was like, yes, you can. So he came off his bench. He shook my hand and the whole court just started clapping. What a way to restore my faith in the justice system. So now it's nowhere stated on my record that I was a prostitute anymore. I remember one time I almost got a job at a photography place and they weren't able to hire me because of my background. I have missed out on these opportunities to change my life. So criminal vacature is something that is tremendously needed for survivors if we're really talking about folks changing their lives. I'm so glad you shared that story, Alicia, because as you just said, there's no record anywhere of what you've been through, but you're still choosing to share it to impact other survivors. I think part of the reason that things have changed so much is because of survivors like you who were able to share your experience and say, this is what needs to change. I see a lot of support and a lot more empathy and understanding for victims. And now we're considered victims. And I'm super honored and excited to be a part of the change and to have not only a seat at the table, but a voice at the table and to be heard. What advice would you have for people wishing to make a difference? Please do not come into this field thinking you're going to save anyone. We don't need you to save us, honey. We have everything inside of us to save ourselves. We are resilient. We are brave. We have been through a lot of things that we had to navigate on our own. 
what we need is folks to come in and bring empathy, bring love, bring understanding, to see things in me that I can't see in myself. My goal is to always be that sunlight in somebody's life to let them know like, hey, if I can change my life, you can change your life too. These Voices of Freedom were recorded and produced by StoryCorps in partnership with the Office on Trafficking in Persons at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. For more information, visit acf.hhs.gov slash OTIP slash voices. Oh, well, Nisha, Shannon, thank you so, so, so much. Um, you're getting also a lot of appreciation and gratitude in the chat for those of you who are in there. Um, and also um, the Changs and Harold, um, there's a lot of real um, appreciation for everyone who's in this virtual space with us together um, for what you've been sharing with us. So thank you for um, also taking the time to be with us again today. Um, both Wilnisha and Shannon. Um, I'm, I'm curious, the, you know, the big question we're asking everyone, why did you want to or agree um, to participate in this project and, and sit down and share your story in this way? Um, I wanted to be a part of this. I just feel like it was a, a very unique and powerful opportunity. I've had many opportunities to share my story and um, to be on numerous stages and things like that, but I've never had the opportunity for it to be recorded in this way and to be able to do it with Shannon. Um, I just thought it was so special and unique. So I was like, I gotta be a part of this. Yeah, and I think for me, um, you know, as soon as I learned about the Voices of Freedom Project, I really, I thought of Wilnesha instantly. Um, you know, Wilnesha, I know that sharing your story is really important to you and the work that you do. And so I just wanted to be alongside you um, as you were getting your story and your voice out there to the world. Thank you, Shannon. You're always alongside me and I appreciate that. And just so thankful to have you as a colleague and a friend. It's, it's amazing. I appreciate that. That's so great. So um, this question for both of you, um, how have the stories and voices of victims and survivors um, hearing those stories and sharing those stories impacted how you approach um, your advocacy work? Um, for me, it's uh, it's affected me tremendously. It's what fuels me every day. It's my accountability. Um, it's, uh, it's just, it's so, I'm just so honored to be able to serve in such a capacity. So I make sure that I'm always talking to my clients or those that I'm able to serve so that it's like my radar to be, to keep, um, sorry, to keep like myself in check and make sure that I'm doing this work authentically and not just doing it for my ego boost or anything like that. Yeah, and I, I think, um, you know, hearing these stories, both from survivors, um, individuals with lived experience, but also people that have just been doing so much work in the field for so long, um, it's really, it's really empowering um, and it's teaching me how I can also improve and approach the work differently when necessary. Um, I think everyone in the anti-trafficking field or really any victim service field can always um, improve and learn. Um, and I think um, applying these new perspectives will, and, and from these stories will really help with that. Again, thank you both so much for sharing the story, for having the conversation. Um, and being willing to, um, to share that with us now, to share that for future generations, I think it's gonna be a gift that really keeps on giving. So it's incredibly generous and, and we thank you. And I know every, everyone that's a part of this project and I think future listeners, thank you um, as well. So um, we have, unfortunately, we have to keep moving on. Um, we only have so much time together. I wish I could talk with all of you for much longer. Um, but I know that there are actually, in addition um, to those of you who we were able to listen to today and just get a little glimpse into your own experience, um, as everyone's mentioned, there are almost 100 of these conversations that are already a part of this collection. And I think that some of you who have joined us um, 
today and are here in this um, community together have done that, have shared your story. And so um, we're just curious if you have um, and want to share in the chat anything about um, what it's meant to you or why you participated in sharing your story. Um, we would love to hear that. We'll just look in the chat to see if there's any of you um, who, who have done that and been able to add your voice to that collection. Um, and then, you know, while, while we're doing that, um, a question for all of us to be able to sit and reflect on. We've heard um, everyone sort of talk a little bit about their past and also look to the future about what lessons um, you might have and want to share. And so if there were one lesson you would want to pass on for future generations, um, whether you're a survivor, whether you're an advocate um, in the work that you do, what would you want that to be? What lesson would you want to live, so want to pass along? So you can share that. Um, in the chat as well. Um, if you feel moved to, we can just take that moment really to just reflect and think about our own stories. Okay. We're gonna give those moments as we go. Um, Anyone, if you want to share any of those reflections um, as, as we move through the, our last sort of 10, 10 minutes together, please um, feel free to do that. Um, I'm seeing a really great um, lessons for future, some additional ones from Harold to be happy, think positive, believe in yourself, be empowered. Thank you, Harold. Um, if anyone wants to add to that, please do. Um, and we're hearing from, from David, when you're at your lowest and feel you have nothing more to give, you can always have hope. Um, this is amazing. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So with the time that we have, we have a little bit more time that we can spend together. And so we wanted to really, um, just open up the floor if you have any questions that you want to ask about Voices of Freedom, um, about um, any of, of the projects happening um, from Office of Trafficking in Persons, um, from the ANA, from StoryCorps, from any of the participants. If you can put that um, in the, uh, the Q&A box, we'll see, take a little um, look at that. So I will field some of these. Please um, go ahead and, and answer them or ask them here. I see that we have um, one question and I'm really going to open this up to, you know, any one of our panelists as we're, as we're asking this question. I think there's perspective from all of you. Um, Tracy's asking, how can law enforcement better help and assist victims? Your stories are really impactful and that's why I do what I do. Um, stay safe and God bless. Does anyone want to take that question? Um, I think um, one way law enforcement can better their work in serving the HT community is this I know it's kind of tough with the work that they do and how they have to show up, but in order to really like, um, I think meet the needs of survivors and to really get them to open up, you have to show up with compassion and show up with like, um, you know, your barriers down a little bit, be a little more open than um, you normally would. Cause it's already a relationship between the community and law enforcement. It's kind of, you know, it's a rocky relationship. So in order to get the survivors to open up and to feel like they can talk to law enforcement, they're going to have to trust you and know that you have their best interests at heart. And then also, I think what a good thing that our nation is doing is like having um, service providers work with law enforcement or social workers work with law enforcement so that the social worker is able to meet um, the survivor on that social aspect. And then, the you know, the law enforcement can do their position. So I think having that collaboration is huge. And it's vital to like the growth of the HT community and in restoring that relationship as well. Great, thank you so much, Vanisha. Um, let's see. Um, 
There's another question I think that's really aimed at um, survivors. So I'll ask, I'll give us an opportunity to ask that one if people are willing um, about um, the relation between past experiences and um, career prospects moving forward. We'll just give a moment for that. And then we have some more questions about the archive um, and recording. Or does anyone want to talk about, I know um, many of you, or Will Nisha and Harold, you have your own experience um, as survivors and kind of made a choice to um, professionally move forward and do advocacy work. Um, do you want to talk at all about the connection between that and what that's meant for you? Yes, I just want to uh, <clears throat> add, Emily, is that uh, survivors, like I think like our poor starters were strong finishers, but we always have a passion a vision and a mission. Many times I have experienced my own personal life and it's a reality. No one will ask a survivor or victim, what is your passion? What's your dream? What was your ambition in life? Because there's a reason I've seen that many survivors do not come out in the open. Because once they come out in the open, the community stigmatizes them as a survivor and they do not get any promotion. They do not get any encouragement and that's a reality. But today what Story Corp is doing is something different. So I really appreciate that. So we need to empower the victims and the survivors and fulfill their dreams. That's one. And number two, I just want to end that on the law enforcement agencies, which you spoke before, is that I've seen that they are engaging survivors in the training programs with the law enforcement agencies. And that has changed a lot with the Department of Homeland Security or all the law enforcement agency. And I would like to share an example of my FBI agent because my case went with the FBI. And when she did all the investigation and when she realized that I'm a victim of, of labor trafficking and debt bondage, she flipped because I was not talking to her. I was not sharing everything because I was scared. I was, because I thought I'm illegal, I'll get deported. But she always then came to me as like a mother. And that changed my thinking. And one example I want to share that she came to my house and she realized that I'm not sharing anything. She went back, came back and knocked and said, Harold, I know if you're working anywhere under table with cash, which I was, that's not my job. My job is to get you a status, to get you a freedom. What you do is nothing. So I'm not here to deport you. But those words, that day changed my life. So I think yeah. law enforcement agencies need to talk it out to the victims openly. I'm not here to deport you. I'm not here to arrest you. Thank you. Mm, thank you, Harold. So I see a lot of really wonderful questions um, coming in about the experience um, of survivors and their lives. And, um, and I want to, I'm going to pivot us a little bit to talk a little bit more again about the Voices of Freedom collection in the StoryCorps archive. Um, because I think what we're hearing today and learning is that we have um, had this opportunity to hear really deeply personal stories about um, uh, the experience of people who have been trafficked and also the past decades of work that's been done um, to, to help end trafficking. Um, and so I want to encourage everyone um, to be visiting the archive um, that Catherine and Kimberly shared about before. I know that folks will be getting a link to that as well. I heard um, should be receiving that so that you can explore that collection and start hearing from everyone um, what their personal experiences have been um, and start to transform that for yourself um, in terms of you know, your understanding and your thoughts forward about advocating for this as well. And you also can contribute um, to this collection um, still. And StoryCorps has um, some tools that make it very easy for you to record a conversation with a colleague, with a friend, with a family member, with a loved one, and immediately share that with the StoryCorps archive and share that with the Voices of Freedom collection so that we can continue to add and watch that grow and hear more and more perspectives. Um, I think that, um, you know, I've, I think I've seen in the chat from some of you, all of those perspectives from advocates to survivors 
are all a part of what makes this um, this collection um, beautiful. And so that's an invitation and encouragement for everyone to do that. There is, um, and maybe Kimberly can, can remind everyone of the link to do this, but there is um, a page on OTIP's website that really walks you through everything that you need to know in order to do this. Um, all of the nitty gritty instructions, some question lists, that really help you be able to have this conversation. So I just wanna invite you um, to do that and add your voice to that collection. It, that means it's something that can still be living and still be growing um, as we move on. Um, and, um, and really quickly, we can ask the question of all of you as we um, get ready to close. Um, we do wanna invite you to do that and um, imagine together feel free to write in the chat and let us know um, who would you want to invite to have a conversation with you as part of this. You don't have to name them specifically. You can say what their relationship is to you. Um, but if there's someone that's just been on your mind as you've been um, listening today um, or someone who you, you think you really want their story to become a part of this, um, ask you to just reflect to yourself. And if, you, if you'd if you like, you can share it in the chat or just kind of put that person in your mind um, as someone who you might want to extend that invitation to, to become a part of this really growing collection. Um, and as we do that, I am actually um, going to pass it back to Catherine um, to be able to close us out um, and, and end our time together today. Oh, thank you so much, Emily, to the StoryCorps team, to our partners at ANA, to the OTIP staff, um, but especially to the survivors and allies uh, who participated in today's event, uh, to those who've shared their stories so far. Uh, when we embarked on this collaboration, the primary goal was really to democratize historical record keeping in the anti-trafficking field. There have been so many individuals, organizations, whether at the government level or non-government or private sector that have contributed to the progress. Um, generations behind us in various social justice movements uh, have, we've been, as some of you noted in the chat, uh, we're standing on their shoulders. And, um, and then also very aware of the younger generation um, where we'll be passing the torch on um, this and so many intersecting issues. So we really wanted to democratize um, the voices, provide the space to be as inclusive as possible. And one of the reasons we chose StoryCorps is because this technology platform through StoryCorps Connect, it really is anyone anywhere in the world um, at any point can have a conversation uh, with a, a family member, friend, a colleague, anyone of their choice um, so that we can be as inclusive as possible in our uh, contributing to our collective understanding of um, this point in time in the anti-trafficking field. Uh, but the two things that uh, I know I've personally learned and um, some of our colleagues in conversation, uh, we've learned as we were engaging in this process is that this project also helped to one, uh, humanize an issue uh, that sometimes can seem so abstract and acting commissioner Michelle Salve mentioned this in her remarks where, you know, where we often hear of numbers and statistics and uh, it's really important to be reminded of the humanity behind um, how this issue impacts individuals and families and communities. And stories can also help dispel myths and misconceptions or misinformation on human trafficking. Um, and then the second lesson, um, having engaged in many of these conversations is that uh, this initiative really helps us to strengthen connections to each other. Uh, uh, we've learned that through the many conversations, uh, there is more that unifies us. There's more that we have in common across the anti-trafficking field um, than the various issues that may often uh, divide the field. And also, you know, when we work together, uh, we're so focused on the 
task at hand, it was truly energizing, as you heard from uh, many of the participants, to be able to pause from our typical meetings and ways of interacting, um, to truly just sit down and listen um, to someone's story and connect and relate. So uh, as we're closing out the programming today, please know this is not the end. Um, it is just the beginning and uh, everyone has a story. So if you've heard about this initiative and wondered uh, whether you had anything to share, please know we believe everyone has a story. Um, so we invite your participation, invite you to invite others uh, to participate. If you have um, had conversation, please have more. And uh, you could record those conversations on StoryCorps Connect as Emily outlined under the resources page. And then you can also visit uh, the Office on Trafficking in Persons website for uh, more information. So thank you all for your time and attention today for uh, sharing in this space together, and most importantly, for um, just listening. Thank you.